Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Hamrick. I'm the senior director of the Data Institute, which is the entity that is sponsoring and organizing uh, DISCO 2023 this year. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying the conference as much as I am. My mind is filled from uh, this morning's talks with ideas related to you know, heterogeneous networks and diversity in persons and diversity in ideas in higher education. Those are just a few of the sessions that I listen to. Let me kind of mention what the game plan is here and then we'll get started. I'm not going to have a long biographical intro of DJ because DJ is gonna weave a lot of stories about his background um, and his story into the answers to the questions that I'll be posing to him. I'll be in conversation with DJ for about uh, 30 minutes or so and then I'll prompt uh, folks a few minutes before I finish up my questions to line up at the microphones and then we will just rotate between the microphones and let members of our audience pose questions to, uh, to DJ. So that's, that's the game plan and let's get, uh, let's get started. Uh, so my opening question for, for DJ, the, the first chief data scientist of the United States is I, I'd like to know a little bit about the history of how this position came into being. Uh, who saw the need and what was the vision for your role? Um, how did the office get created? And how did you manage the first few critical months kind of defining and shaping that role? Yeah, so it, it was not a job that I was trying out for. It, was, it wasn't like the thing of like, oh, we should go create this office inherently. What, what I think is it's to put it in perspective is you have to start during the campaign of President Obama. And I was not involved in that, but the, one of the things that was very obvious was the power of how analytics and data was coming together. And that people were able to mobilize large blocks of voters to uh, be effective and come together. And that team that had created a lot of that, that effort, people like Dan Wagner, a CEO, founder of Citizen Analytics, or Kit Rodolfa, who's an academic, uh, at, at Stanford, they are the really ones who had kind of come up with this, like, hey, you could do something powerful with data. And, and the uh, president, President Obama, saw that power. He also saw this power that was starting to transform the world through the first incarnation of really Silicon Valley of using data starting to take place. And so he saw the confluence of all these things coming together. And so one of the things he, he committed to was the creation of a role called the U.S. Tech, Chief Technology Officer. And the first person to hold that office was Anish Chopra and then Todd Park. And both of their portfolios heavily, w w the central focus of that was data. How do we open up data? How do you take data that, that exists inside the federal system and make it available to everybody? You know, this is kind of the classic data that I relied upon when I was a grad student with, with with Steve uh, was just downloading lots of, of weather data to try to play with it, to come up with a way to find insights, to develop new scientific theories around weather forecasting. You know, take t the, all those activities you start to open, every time you opened up a little bit of data, say healthcare data, which is an incredibly non-transparent portion of our economy, you open up a little bit of that and the whole world moves. And you're seeing this happen right now around a rule that CMS Centers for Medicare Medicaid uh, Services put out there, which is on price transparency. Like you have no idea if how much your MRI is going to cost from UCSF versus Kaiser or another place. And so now by by rule that is that is required. And so everyone is recalibrating. So you got to you saw these things take place. And as the third uh, uh, chief technology officer search opened up, there was three people who were the finalists. One was Megan Smith, who was the eventual choice for the CTO, Alex McGivery, who was uh, general counsel for Twitter, and myself. And what they realized is, well, one, you want the CTO to take a different direction. We can talk more about that, which is Megan's sort of arc was really to kind of say, how can we inspire people and technologists to come work on a different set of problems? Simultaneously, we needed to really say, hey, this data, this, this data portfolio needed to not only graduate, it needed to continue, but it needed to be something that every president going forward would have access to, would have somebody there to help shepherd this. And so that then became the formation of, of the, the, US, uh, the US chief data scientist. And in that choice, there was a very careful, deliberate process 
to actually define the mission statement. And the mission statement of that office is to responsibly unleash the power of data to benefit all Americans. And, and the two parts of that statement that are very carefully chosen is one, responsibly. And now it's, you're hearing everyone talk about ethics and AI and all these type things, data. This was intentionally chosen by a president who is not a technologist, but saw what could happen to populations if we're not careful with this. The second was a very clear mandate to make sure it benefits all Americans. And some might be thinking like, why only Americans? Why not international? Why not everyone? And it's just because it's the, what is the role of the US federal government? That, it, that is a legal kind of structure. So it was benefit all Americans. And partly is that it's like, we're here in Silicon Valley. How many times do we have a technology that we're like, oh, that's amazing. That's radical. That's revolutionary and it benefits only people with a smartphone and a Tesla who drink uh, matcha lattes. Uh, you know, like that's, like I know, it, like, but that's like the version that we have. And so what we really said and asserted that we should consider a technology neither radical nor revolutionary and that less it literally benefits everyone. And some of the problems that you all are working on right now very honestly, we have to ask ourselves, how do we ensure that benefits everyone? Some of you are probably going after cancer. Well, how are you gonna make sure that when you find that great insight, it's not gonna only benefit those that are at major medical institutions? What does it look like to give care delivery for the whole population of the country? And why not expend it to the whole world? What does it look like given the inequities that we have across systems? So the portfolio of that office as it was set up with that mission statement, kind of had a number of focus areas. One very explicit, and, and the, this is the rubric of this office was, number one, it needs to impact $1 trillion of spend. Two, and these are ORs. Two is uh, um, impacts 50% of the United States population, or helps a population that has no recourse. And really, all of this has to align with presidential priorities in the broader landscape of what, the, what the, uh, the, the White House is trying to accomplish. And so what are problems? Like, if you kind of wrap your head around this, and this, this actually happened to me. I was presenting to the, the, there's a group of advisors of scientists and technologists uh, the president has called PCAST. And I was presenting to them, and actually Eric Schmidt uh, was one of the people on there. And he pulled me aside and he said, first, he's like, you know, I think you know how to think about problems that are the billions. I don't think you know how to really think about a trillion dollar problem. And I thought about it and I was like, what is a trillion dollar problem? So 50% of the population or population has no recourse. So let's kind of go through a quick list. Trillion dollar problems, healthcare, 20% of GDP. Pick it any way you want. The healthcare delivery, drug discovery, any of those, those are all in there. Criminal justice reform. That's a trillion dollar problem based on how we put way too many people into our jails. And you all are in San Francisco, you're seeing it right here on our streets with homeless people, mental health issues cycling in and out of our jail system. We also have an, an unacceptable murder rate, we should call it a murder rate, uh, with our law enforcement officers. And there's just too many people, most often people of color or people with mental health issues who are being killed on the streets. We also have officers who are being put in very dangerous situations without the right training, the right equipment, all of that. So we have both sides of that, that equation. In the bucket of 50% of the population, those problems all apply. What's a problem that, where there's a problem that a population has no recourse? What does it look like to build a census for the transgender population? Why do transgender people have to go through TSA scanners that select them based on this artificial profile of gender? Like we have supposed to have machine learning and AI that's supposed to be amazing. I can't really figure out what security should look like. So there's a population that is being demeaned, like no dignity in that process at all, but we have technical solutions that could solve for that and keep us safe simultaneously. So that kind of gives you a little bit of the rubric of how that office was created and, and kind of its scope. And it is an office, so many think Democrat, Republican, because that's our way our system works. It was an office that existed during the Trump administration. They just couldn't find anybody who was willing to take their job. 
uh, but the, the, it is an office that is designed forever on out. And, and something I should mention also is, well, there is a U.S. chief statistician, by the way. That is a role, uh, and that, that is in a very critical role. But what's interesting is the chief data scientist has a role that can talk to the, the, the economic council, the advisors for the economic council, the different cabinet members, and leverage the chief data scientist, or sorry, the, the chief statistician, Department of Labor and Statistics and all these other places. So, so the chief data scientist gets to be a horizontal across all these things. And one of the key people who was, I was fortunate to be able to recruit to our team is Denise Ross, who is the current US chief data scientist mm -hmm. and has been championing a lot of these efforts as well. It, words and phrases matter and titles matter, I think. And you know, it, just a few days ago, DJ, this list came out from Indeed about the top jobs for 2023, and it notably dropped the title of data scientist from that list, but it has machine learning engineer, it has mm -hmm. pen tester on it, and uh, it has data Prompt engineer. engineer. Yeah, 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 yeah. It has data <laughs> engineer on it too. So I, I think you had a role uh, to play in kind of identifying uh, an initial title for many of the folks that would be working in that office that would be suitable. What's the, what's the story behind that? Yeah. So this actually goes back to the uh, early days of LinkedIn. And um, uh, everyone probably has heard of LinkedIn at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so LinkedIn had, uh, we bet the company of LinkedIn on data. Like that, what something people don't really realize is the key strategic goal of LinkedIn was to use data in novel ways. And so we had a team that we created that wasn't just some back office team that took orders from other people. It was part of the entire product organization. So we had engineers, we had data scientists. We, we didn't call ourselves that at that time. We didn't call them data engineers. We just called ourselves people. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we, we kind of were just, we had some goals. So one of them was we were trying to figure out products that could add value. So Jonathan Goldman uh, it came up with this idea of you come to this site and there should be something that says people you may know. And so he invented this thing called People You Know. It was copied by every social media site. Steve Stegman created this idea of um, who viewed my profile and try to use that. Monica Rigatti came up with this idea of job, job, um, uh, 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 job recommendation algorithms. Uh, a person named Dylan Fields, who some of you might have heard about, who was an intern for us. Uh, he created a company called Figma eventually, but he came up with this idea of LinkedIn skills along with Pete Skomarach and a bunch of others. So we had these ideas and these turned out to not only be large uh, pr uh, like products that had a really large footprint in adding value for people, but they also were large revenue generators for, for LinkedIn. And so as we're going along, one thing that people often think is like there was a huge amount of competition between the companies in the, in the Valley. And there was, we were very fierce competitors. We also collaborated a lot. And so Jeff Hammerbacher, who is running the data team at Facebook, him and I would sit down every so often and say, what's working for you guys? You know, the data systems, what core technologies, what are you guys gonna work on open sourcing? What are you, and so it was kind of the idea of more water in the harbor floats all boats. And I approached Jeff with this problem I had gotten re recently, because HR had come to me and said, hey, you've got too many job titles in your org. You've got, you know, analysts, research scientists, business intelligence, like you have all these titles, like, you know, the engineers are engineers, the salespeople are sales designers, like what the heck are you guys and come up with a career ladder. I said, gee, like, what does it mean to be a career ladder? What does it mean for a title? And so Jeff and I started working on a list and you know, we kind of had all these titles and then we kind of went through the list and we're like, oh, analyst, that feels a little too Wall Street. Research scientists felt a little too academic wasn't quite the jam. We're like, wow, statistician, that'll piss off all the economists. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, we don't need a, like a war <laughs> in the team. And so, you know, we kind of, you know, Jeff had this idea of data scientists. I remember thinking like, isn't that redundant? Like we're data and we're scientists. It kind of seems that. So I took it back to the team. And Monica, uh, Monica Rigatti had this great idea. She's like, well, we're LinkedIn. Why don't we post all the jobs with all the different titles and see what everyone applies to? And so guess what everyone applied to? Data scientist. So that's how we were like, we're gonna call mm -hmm. ourselves data scientists. We were not trying to 
be like, this is the thing, this is the new thing, whatever. But we built out a career ladder and we had to say, this is what it meant to be a data scientist. This is how you get promoted. This is how we write down what your progression of career is. And then what we saw also happening is because LinkedIn did really well in its IPO, Facebook did really well in its IPO, all these other companies were like, what's that secret sauce you guys are doing with data? Suddenly they were like, we want some of that. So Tom Davenport and I wrote this article called uh, uh, Data Scientist is the Sexiest Job of the 21st Century, which we did not title. Harvard Business Review titled it, uh, <laughs> which shows they know how to do clickbait too. But uh, the, the part that, that it took off, it's actually one of the, the 100 most downloaded articles ever in Harvard Business Review history. And I think the reason is everyone was very hungry for this, how do we use data? And I think as, as people were kind of were realizing you can actually do a lot, they said, oh, this title data scientist is the thing. And, and I think the question we should step back and ask is like, why is this title stuck? Why has it worked? And the honest answer is because no one knows what the hell it really means. Like if you're in a company, they're like, oh, you're a data scientist. Like think about it, if you before went into a room and there's like, you know, some big important business meeting or some kind of really important policy problem. And then you were like, oh, I'm in business intelligence. They'd be like, why are you here? This is an important meeting. Now, if you're the data scientist, they're like, thank God someone brought someone who's smart to this meeting. <laughs> and now when you're in that meeting, suddenly you get context. You're in the meeting, you have context, you understand all the different parts of it. Then you have technical skills that you get to utilize to actually make an impact. And then everyone's stunned that you actually can do something. And it's like skills, talent, problem with context. Okay, now you know how to do your job. It's shocking how rare that happens. And one of the things we used to joke is we'd go to CEOs and be like, you know, for those that are Star Trek fans, like we'd say to them, like, who's your Spock on the bridge? because we're only about the original version, no TNG here. <laughs> Somebody's going to hate on me for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, it's surprising how little it is. And I can assure you this, in meetings with the president or others, the reason I was effective is because I had the context versus like you're separated so far from the problem that by the time it gets to you, you don't really know what to do. This allows you to be creative in different ways. Interesting, interesting. I, w I want to ask you in a minute about the role of your office with the management of the COVID-19 global pandemic, but putting a pin in that for a moment, what's something you look back on as being the most important initiative or most impactful work that you did in your time as U.S. Chief Data Scientist? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole slew of things that, that I, I'm super proud of, of the team doing. It's not just I, I get too much of the credit. This is, this is uh, you know, my f saying is always data science is a team sport. The work that we did, we were so fortunate not only to have a president who was incredibly focused on our mission, our goals and empowering us, but we also, ha we, we had a team that really cared deeply. And you know, some of the things that I think is gonna be the ones that I'm watching most over is President Obama realized that, well, we've had so much time since starting the Human Genome Project, to this day, we still don't receive tailored medical treatments. And so I see a lot of people who are Asian in the audience. One of the things to think about for this case is if you go to the hospital or you have a loved one who's elderly and goes to the hospital who's having a stroke, the physician team is going to look at them and say, Asian, and not give them this type of blood thinner. This blood thinner is a life-saving drug. Uh, it is absolutely a miracle kind of drug. However, by and large for the Asian population, you don't need that much of it. it you'll bleed out if you're given it. Hmm. But there's a gene marker for it. And so if there was a way to say that yes, you are of this type, you will get the life-saving drug versus no, this is very, very dangerous for you. Just because, and we don't have this. So what does it take for us to have that kind of genomic medicine ready at hand to give you that 
tailored treatment with, and making sure that data is safe and secure with all the right privacy measures also. How do we do that? What does it mean to push ourselves into an era of truly genomic medicine? And so I got to see that take place and, and what I believe is going to transpire for that. Now, when we started, there weren't really any programs that were so very hyper-focused on the intersection of of data science, chemistry, math, biology, all the different pieces, and now that is a given in the bio, uh, the bioengineering er sector, the medical institutes. Everyone is becoming more interdisciplinary. Uh, and that was a thing, like when I think all of us were students, would not have been possible. Right. It was very, very hard to commit someone to do yeah. it. And uh, the part there that I, I think of the most, which is both painful and heartening, is a number of families and people that I got to talk to who need a cure yesterday. And a large percentage of the people that I worked with or talked to on these issues, unfortunately, their cures did not get to them in time. We've also seen an incredible amount of increase in lifespan because of it for those, some of those populations, especially with rare diseases, but we're far from it. I'll tell you my greatest regret. Uh, I have two. One, we were literally, the president was on his way to give the State of the Union address and we had a paragraph in there about transforming the organ donation program inside the country and creating a national effort to revamp the way we do organ donations. Uh, you know, in mathematics, we've seen this for quite a long time about how we can do much more sophisticated yeah. ways of distribution of organs, save a lot more lives, something called kidney chains also, or, you know, that these organ chains, uh, we could have done so much more. And the other one that I just did not have enough time for was to get a commitment from every major university, uh, academic center, technology company that everyone was going to commit to any training that happens around data or technology must have ethics integrated into the curriculum. Not some extra course that you take, but absolutely integrated into the, the curriculum because you're seeing the issue sets emerge that we were most concerned about uh, taking place. Well, I'll just point out quickly that our MS in data science program has a one unit data ethics elective and our Center for Excellent. Applied Data Ethics integrates um, data ethics work across the, the functional areas of the Data Institute. I, I want to go back to this topic of the COVID-19 global pandemic because I think in hindsight, uh, and if you consider like Michael Lewis's recent book, Premonition, we're going to understand that it, to date is probably the most data managed uh, global health event in human history so far. But um, you were on the ground rolling out the response with your team to that pandemic in places like California. What, what were the first 100 days like uh, when there was a paucity of data and you were setting up systems to collect um, and pipeline data, but, but decisions still had to be made very quickly? Um, t tell us some stories about how that played out. Yeah, so um, what happened was uh, myself and a number of others who'd seen, watched the Ebola response take place were were really attuned to watching what was happening internationally. And we sh would share a lot of information about what biological vectors are there. And I'd spent a, uh, some of my time uh, after, uh, after gra uh, graduate school uh, as in the on the ground in Central Asia in former bioweapons facilities, actually existing bioweapons facilities from the Soviet Union to prevent those, those uh, pathogens from going to Iraq or North Korea or to other terrorist groups. And so I'd kind of seen firsthand what these kind of, like what could possibly, like basically what our last few years have looked like as we've been going stumbling along through, through wave after wave of COVID. And I also, in my day job at that time, we take, started a company called Devoted Health where we take care of senior citizens who are oftentimes very sick, very poor. Like, these are not the areas where putting a smartwatch on them is gonna make them magically better. This is like, think trailer homes, think people in very, very tough neighborhoods. And so th this type of populations are in the bullseye of these kind of viruses and other type of, of um, uh, infections, fungal, all these type things. Uh, and so we had gotten wind that COVID could be really potentially bad and devastating. 
And so two ships were arriving here, cruise, two cruise ships were arriving here. We started to see the, the issues coming out of Wuhan. We had also started to see that what was happening in Italy. And so the, um, as California was starting to figure out what to do, uh, we, a message had kind of gotten to us about what the government state of California was going to do around COVID or how they were starting to think about it, especially from a data management perspective. And so I ended up somehow on a, on a, a, a late Saturday, Sunday uh, call with the governor's team, uh, Governor Newsom's team. And we sort of, they walked us through the strategy and I said, that's not what I would do. I was, and I said, I would have a different strategy. And largest was informed by our response on, uh, on Ebola. And so they said, well, what would you do? And I said, give me, give me about two hours and I will have a, a, a playbook written down for you. Because we'd written, we'd helped write the previous playbook. So it wasn't like I magically just was coming up with something. And so we wrote that down, we kind of wrote down that playbook. And then they said, so who's going to do this? And we said, well, we were happy to put a team together. And they said, what's it going to cost? And we're like, cost? <laughs> like, how about we don't have a pandemic? That yeah. would, <laughs> that's what we really want. And so we put a team together and we drove up the next day and we, uh, we were there in Sacramento on the ground um, building out the plan. If any of you saw those early graphs of what the pandemic was looking like for California, as well as what our capacity for our healthcare system to have it, that was a collective team done uh, by uh, Justin Lesseter, who was at John Hopkins University, his model at the time. But we had two data, uh, two data uh, what you might call data engineers, software developers, who we had, he had, we had convinced to join us and they had literally taken that model out of the academic realm, put it on AWS um, with uh, a lot of help from Amazon to basically just give us as much compute as we needed. And we ran those models until we could finally get a sense of that. Now, you might think this is just a data story. Uh, every morning and late night, I was on calls with Italy and New York to hear what was happening. And so one of the things you might think about was like, there's this question about why was the issue given or the order given by California to stay at home, the shutdown orders? It's simply one thing, to buy ourselves another day. When you have that and you have the models and you kind of look at what would happen if we saw anything even remotely close to what happened in Italy or in New York, and people kind of say, ah, it wasn't that bad. I, t I can tell you talking to crying medical staff in those facilities about what was happening, it was real. And we did no clue how bad it was gonna be. And so if we lost 10 to 20% of our healthcare capacity in California, physicians, nurses, cleaning staff, all the other parts of the, the medical system, we would not get it back for more than a decade. We would literally collapse our system. And so the whole goal was to buy ourselves another day. And that's where the modeling efforts, the collection of data, we put together a whole thing very quick. And so you might have heard of US Digital Response. Those were efforts that we helped spin up. A whole bunch of other groups, COVID tracking project where you saw all those models, all those things were kind of spun up by like-minded people. And so the part I would tell you more than anything else is we, went, we have gone from a world where data science was, how do you get someone to click on an ad or a widget in an app to being a form of, here's how we actually are going to act as a society. Here's the decisions that are gonna be made by governors, by presidents, prime ministers, everybody. And our, like a lot of the, our framework, our technology, the tools we built, were used around the world. And that, who did that? One thing to remember, it was not just a team of government people. It was not just a team of data scientists. It was a collaborative effort of interdisciplinary people coming together to solve an incredibly timely hard problem. And something that we saw in this process, and I would tell all of you as you're thinking about it, as data people, we were too slow. 
we were not effective enough. We could not answer the questions, the classic questions that are what I'd call the semicolon or the and kind of questions. Somebody says, what happens if we close, we shut everything down? What happens, however, if we open, a, open schools, but not preschools? Or what happens if we keep these type of facilities? We start getting to these ands or ors. What happens if you keep the beaches open here, but not here? What happens now? What about transport? What about how do we make sure that our, our, um, our crops and the essential workers who take care of everything in the fields, we don't lose them? What does this look like for these different things? We could not keep up with those answers. We could not answer those questions in a sufficient time. We need to get our systems, our places to clean data. We didn't even know the fact that COVID tracking project had to get stood up to count how many cases of COVID were going on, how many deaths are happening around. We didn't even have the basics. So we, we need to be so efficient that we've gone, like as much progress we've made, we need to be able to stand up infrastructure and answer questions that much faster than we ever, like it, it's the next crisis that will come about must have all of us collectively on this new proverbial front line of data to drive decision making and help people take action. So, so data is clearly this very important thing in a, in a multipolar world where we have agents that are competing with the United States in a variety of different respects. Data has come to be viewed over the past couple of decades as an asset just as important as national defense or having a highly educated population. And so in that sense, what, what would you suggest needs to be the R&D apparatus behind data and data science at the federal level and uh, for the U.S. to be competitive for the next mm -hmm. century? What, what, what does that look like at the post-secondary level in terms of educational yeah. investments? Yeah, so one thing we wrote, um, which is, is the national strategy for artificial intelligence. This was written at the very tail end of the Obama administration. That then a number of other countries, including China, were like, hey, that's a really good plan. We should go implement that. We've been quite slow as the United States to actually mobilize and act on it. Now, the current uh, administration, the Biden administration, has really started to act on that around the CHIPS Act, other kind of large spending infrastructure. The thing that we need is we basically need something on the order of the CHIPS Act every year to stay competitive on this, on this races. So what does that specifically mean? We need to be able to, not just from a national security perspective, have access to the next drug discoveries, the next care models, all of those type of things, not only for our population, but to ensure that those systems have Western values. But we also need to ensure that we're, we're leading from the front. Because when you do that, you're able to set what the policy should look like from an ethical perspective, what is, what is acceptable, what is not. Especially as you get into genomic CRISPR style treatments that might affect the, the human germline. Basically editing in a way that might modify all humans. Things like that start to get really important. The second is that, and we're starting to see this, is the entire US R&D apparatus has to shift in a couple ways. Number one, this needs to be an offense first strategy. What does an offense first strategy mean? Is One is a defensive strategy is like no immigration. That's a terrible policy. Our policy should be this, you come here to work, to live, to raise your kids because it is the best place to do that and you are going to have the best outcomes for your families as a result of that. So that, that is the way to play it, not defensive and prevent people from doing things. Number two, we need to have a massively interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach to things. So our approach of the traditional academic institution of like math is over here, well, guess what? Hospital and medical is on a different campus, therefore they never actually ever meet. That has to change, and it has to be an and. We can't lose a traditional background of mathematics, physics, statistics, all those things, but we have to create a horizontal. One of the reasons data science as a major has taken off is because it's the one horizontal where you could be doing archaeology and math. If you see, look at economic students, they're taking machine learning and AI classes. Maybe some of you are in that bucket because it's that horizontal that allows you to play. 
and universities have been too slow, in my opinion, to recognize this shift of what the population wants, what industry wants. And so we have to figure out how to make that an and. That includes funding for R&D across the government. Our traditional model of bureaucracy, National Institutes of Health, NSF over here. Like if somebody's, if you know, if you're a mathematician and you try to get funding from National Institute for Health, your department's not even gonna know how to yeah, do that. Yeah. And vice versa, it's, it's just two, they're, they're just two big regulatory type things. What we found in Cancer Moonshot, as well as Precision Medicine, is you have to slam these together from a bureaucracy perspective. And what you're starting to see NSF doing, and you're gonna see much more of this over the coming years and decades, is we are going to move to a much more interdisciplinary approach. Because that is the only way we're going to get to this next generation of, sol of solutions. So I've got three questions for you about education, and I think a couple of them are along the lines of advice. So uh, we have um, graduated 800 students from our program here at the University of San Francisco. We've got students from uh, many different universities in the audience today. A lot of people, their first pass dream is, is to get one of these uh, tech jobs with tremendous sex appeal at, at a meta or a BlackRock mm -hmm. or a, 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 you know. LinkedIn. If LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, so, so what would you say to somebody to give them pause about mm -hmm. considering um, a job in the public sector, an yeah. opportunity in the public sector? So here, there's a couple things I would tell you. First is I meet so many students who are like trying to go for the, 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 the label of the place. And I would encourage you to think about it slightly differently, which is optimize first for where you are going to learn the most. For every one year of experience, there's one year, let's call it one year of experience, one year of life. That's a 1x job. If you get three years of experience in one year, that's a 3x job. There's certain jobs that are 7x, 10x. 10x jobs are like at the White House where the average tenure is about a year and a half because your body physically breaks down. You're working so hard. There's also times where you sometimes need to be in a half X job. You're taking care of your own health. You're taking the care of the health of someone else or other type of things are going on. And so using that rubric, at a minimum, you should be at a three X job. Coming out of school, you should be at somewhere more around a seven X job. And so rather than thinking about it as what salary are you going to make? What are you going to do? Think about it as who is going to be around you that you are going to learn such an insane amount about that the job after this job, you are going to be positioned for to be doing amazing, amazing work. Now, that might be at one of these well-known places. Many times it's not. It's at these places where there's phenomenal mentorship. Uh, one of the things that people also choose, and this is why I think it's also important, is like a lot of times people are like thinking about grad school, oh, you have to go to one of the brand name places. But the places where you actually get better training is the places that people are overlooking. I mean, Steve and I went to Maryland together, and a lot of people were like, why would you guys go to Maryland? They don't realize like how much we grew together, at, not only as, as kind of as teammates, collaborators, all these things, but you had a different approach. You know, it just was a better program in many ways because it allowed us to get so much more hands-on. I was writing research grants I, I, in a way that would not have happened somewhere else. So go to places where you're gonna get that experience. The other one I would tell you about public service, and so I entered public service, as, as I just had become junior faculty at University of Maryland, 9-11 happened, and then I moved in. And I would tell you this about public service. There's very few jobs where you have one goal. And your one goal is to make the world a better place for your kids and your kids' kids. That's all you have to do. Just that one job. And you are tasked with that job. Most of the time working in public service, it's you're banging your head 99% of the time against the wall. But that 1% of the time you make progress, you are going to transform the system. And, and it's not easy. It's really hard and it can be very personal. Like the number of times and people can hear can also, we can have that debate about some of the decisions we made around COVID, some of the other choices and other things. That's okay. That's fair game. Those are, that's what it means if I'm, I'm a, when I'm in a, as a role as a public servant. 
But the thing I also get to do is I am empowered to help somebody. And when I get up in the morning, I get to ask, what could I do? And when I go to the night, I get to say, have I done better? And there is something so unbelievably powerful about it. The only thing I think that comes close to it, honestly, is the educational sector, where you have one job, which is to make sure the next generation is ready and prepared. And so I would encourage everybody to take some portion of your life to do public service. And it could be in true public service. You could be elected. You could be you know, in a role like I've been in. Maybe you're also just a volunteer for something like Code for America or a crisis text line or, or you know, U.S. Digital Response. There's lots of ways to serve. But when, when you do see it, you're going to get a lot. You're going to be touched in different ways. And it's, it's a weird thing that once you've touched it, you can't let go of it. There, there's a saying that um, my mentor, who unfortunately passed away recently, Ash Carter, he was the 25th Secretary of Defense, and he used to say, oxygen, uh, security is like oxygen. You only know you need it when you don't have it. And when you're the person making sure that everyone else gets a chance to sleep better at night, to sleep soundly, to sleep safe, that their destiny is part of your responsibility, that's something that I, I just, it is a feeling and a, uh, a level of, if you get the chance to have that opportunity, I just hope that you all will take it. Great. I'm going to ask two more quick questions, but I'll also invite folks to start lining up behind the mics. When you ask your question, I'll, I'll ask you to just say what your name is and, and then your question. But uh, as you start doing that, my next question is, uh, we, we have this thing at this conference uh, called a mentor mentee lunch. And so I, I had lunch with a number of students today who are trajecting in their, their data science careers. And you know, some, there were some trepidations expressed about bumps along the way, classes that maybe they'd gotten grades in that were, were not awesome, uh, or more work that needed to be done to learn Python better. And you, you have kind of an interesting educational trajectory. And one of our yeah, trustees, yeah, well, <laughs> one, one of our trustees, Judy Miner, who's the chancellor of the Foothill De Anza Community College District, just burst with pride at the fact that DJ um, is a product of, of her system. And so tell us a little bit about that trajectory and what yeah. people ought to worry about or not worry about. Yeah, so, um, you know, I didn't get into college. <laughs> it's the, the top level. I, I, I went to community college. I went, and I was so fortunate that I went to this uh, De Anza Junior College, which uh, has an unbelievable faculty who care, who are there to, to, to work with you. And I got to be also exposed to students who every choice they made was a trade-off between putting food on the table or studying or doing, like taking a class. And so seeing that really changed my perspective. I was also fortunate that I went to uh, De Anza with my girlfriend, and she took this class called Calculus, so I took this class called Calculus, and I fell in love with math. And so it, it did a lot for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the advice I would have over this, though, is if there's one thing that you have to get used to in data or anything we do these days, is know that your skills are going to be out of date. And it's going to be out of date shockingly fast. I mean, I started with, you know, basic and then Pascal. And then it was like, before I knew it, it was Java. And then it was Python. And so like, well, MATLAB somewhere in there. And like, you know, there's like a ton of other stuff like that, that kind of is constantly popping up. And so you have to find ways to develop a skill to be a lifelong learner develop curiosity, develop passion. But the other thing I would tell you is the reason I've fundamentally, I think I've been, been able to be successful is I never ever approach a problem alone. I never work on something by myself. Uh, I think way too often I get disproportionate credit, but I can tell you like the names of all the people that came to bear, including the COVID response, where it was Kara DeFrias, Mike Wilkening, Todd Park, Bob Kocher, Charity Dean, who's featured in Premonition, like the list goes on and on and on. None of this works without them. So one of the things that's most important for all of you to do here is who's on your team. 
you know, like you're out there trying to interview, why aren't you interviewing each other and practicing? You probably have your LinkedIn profile and your resumes. Why aren't you giving it to each other and being brutally honest with each other about it? Like not to be jerks, but to give each other very harsh feedback. Same way if you're giving a practice talk somewhere, why aren't you getting a whole bunch of people in a room to criticize it constructively and be helpful? You're a team. By design, when you go to curriculum and programs like this, the goal of putting you in there and working groups and everything is to build a team. Why wouldn't you extend that to life? To help figure out how to do things. Like that is like your nexus, your tribe starts here. Your social network starts here. And if you're not using it to your maximum ability to actually take this into the real world sector of saying, how do I know somebody at that company? Do I have another friend there? All of those aspects are really some of the most powerful things that I would say that are going to get you your job. I can tell you myself, when I moved out here back from uh, DC and Maryland to get a job, no one took me seriously on this idea of data with companies. I talked to Sergey Brin, founder of, of, of Google and his team. And by the way, his dad, Sergey's dad was a professor of Steve's and mine at Maryland. So I, I had a lot of privilege to talk to him. His mom was on research grants with me and yet still no one was willing to take it. You know how I got a job here? It's because my mom was at a, at a, a coffee thing with the president of Skype and she harassed him until he took a call with me. So that's a lot of privilege in there. But the, what was there is I was talking to lots of other people and sharing with people I'd gone to undergrad with or other things. And they were like, oh yeah, DJ is really smart. He's good, why don't we give him a chance? And by the way, three weeks into that job, we'd already shown how powerful data had mm -hmm. happened. And mm -hmm. that's what sort of started the domino effect of everyone using data. All right, my last question before we move on to the audience. So, You'd mentioned that you got a PhD at the University of Maryland, and what I've been told is that you were on a men's intramural soccer team there yeah. with <laughs> our fourth academic program director, Steve Devlin, who may be one of the best soccer players of all time. So I, I wanted to know what that was like. What Steve, was that like? Steve was our striker. He was he was our speed. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, defense, and my job was to get the ball to Steve. Uh, I think the the my favorite moment there was. Uh, to one, we, we were just called the math, math. I think we just called ourselves math, right? So when, the, yeah, we had a super creative name, but it was like whenever uh, you lost to math, you'd have to go around and say, who'd, like, who'd you guys play? Well, we played math and lost. So that, and we, we won the overall championship a few times, a couple times, a couple times. We, we, we won it, uh, and it was, uh, it was a really cool special team that we, we had. I tried to get Nike to sponsor us because <laughs> uh, uh, I figured, like, what's the most powerful, captivating real estate ever? It's the back of a math professor. <laughs> 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 and so I was trying to get them to get, like, to, but I, I was not, I didn't have the negotiation skills back then. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, let's, let's involve our audience in the conversation now. Yeah. If you didn't introduce yourself, and then feel free to adjust the microphone or pull it out if you'd like. Thank you so much for your amazing insight mm -hmm. in the data science, world of data science. Um, I'm Purna, I'm the director of the data science program at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like to hear your view on the future of data science. Data science has been evolving uh, compared to the past. I really like to hear your view on the future of data science. So the, the what is the future of data science? Um, I think that it is, being written right now by so many of us, like we're, everyone together is writing this. Like I, I, I am constantly surprised. I'll tell you like one that I'm super surprised by. Why are physical models, like modeling everything from fluid flows, Navier-Stokes type thing, high Reynolds solution, the high Reynolds number th type things, or colloids, why is that working so well when we know the physics, but actually mixed AI solutions are performing so well? This still to me is just like super surprising. I think there's also a huge amount there where everyone's still operating in spatial domains. Like people don't know how to operate in the frequency domains for these models, which is something like 
you know, the mathematics side brings together on this would actually outperform in that versus just people who are just traditional AI kind of focus. So I think there's a lot there. I still think we have barely scratched the surface on drug delivery systems, uh, drug discovery, all these components. Uh, and I'm, I, so I, I'm just always surprised and excited by, whoa, I didn't see that coming. And, and so that is some of the best stuff. I think there's a really important role that all of us have to play on policy. I think at, at Georgetown, one of the very special things is uh, there's a center at, at Georgetown that does a lot around public policy. Uh, uh, I think the new director is just about to be announced, or if not already. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a spectacular place of the intersection between technology and policy. My hope and what we've seen right now is we right now have technologists who are starting to get to the proverbial policy table, but they're not at the table permanently. And we need that to switch. We need a future Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Labor, Director of the National uh, NIH to be substantially more data oriented than we have had. And we've seen that perform, outperform. Uh, Ash Carter had PhDs in uh, physics. Steve Chu is a uh, Nobel laureate who's Secretary of Energy. So we've seen that, but we need we need much, much more of that than just like the way we think we're like, maybe one day we'll have a role at NIST. That's awesome. We should think way bigger. Like those of you, like some of you should be thinking like, not just elected, but literally what is it gonna take for you to run the national level or international program on these issues. Where are the data scientists helping on refugees? How are we helping make sure those that are in Syria and Turkey right now who have had their worlds literally destroyed, what are we doing for them? We have climate change that is going to upend all of our lives and we have to rethink supply chains to energy solutions to all of it. That is an all of society problem. And who is going to be able to give the greatest lever arm on this? It's going to be the technologists. It's going to be the data scientists. So that's, that's really where I would put our, our energy into is like, let's think about the problem and ask how can data be the lever arm for that? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my name's Ian, I'm an incoming data science student, so I'm new. Um, I was wondering, I, you noted that data is incredibly powerful, especially for social good work, and in a lot of these industries, they don't have infrastructure, or they don't even know what the power is. I come from a public defense background. Oh yeah, public defense oh my gosh. Doing this stuff. Clemency is like my, my, like, uh, uh, I, I am so infuriated around, Clem like how much more speed we could do around clemency just in yeah. prioritizing the order. Big time. Or purging, purging records. Yeah, seriously. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any advice of how to kind of convince people in these industries that haven't had data scientists who don't use data, like what that power is and how like they should build these infrastructures if they don't have it. Yeah, so, um, great question. Like how do you co-opt from within? So I'll just kind of maybe share this with a little bit of a story to help it. Like, so when we were really thinking about criminal justice reform, one of the things that was, as we were kind of laying out the framework, I had really wanted to said, like, I think we can do a lot on this area. And everyone's advice to me was like, do not put that into the memo. Like, do not establish that as the lane of work. And I was like, why? And they're like, because they don't know how, like, you're a threat to them. You're confusing. You're weird to them. And so I was like, okay, I'm not going to do it. But there's an adage of never let a good crisis go to waste. And so we saw the killing of Michael Brown. We saw what happened in Ferguson. Valerie Jarrett, who is the president's primary advisor on, uh, uh, on these issues, started to convene people. And so I was able to get myself in the room because I had the fancy title, which was what President Obama was trying to do with the title. And so I was there, and everyone in the civic rights community was like, why is DJ here? Like, mm, he's not, this isn't his lane. Like, go back to go play with your genomic medicine stuff. Like, and so, but they couldn't get rid of me, and I kept bringing up sort of questions. It'd be like, so body cameras, who's going to pay for that? What happens with the, the, like, who gets access to it? How do we make sure it's not, someone's not messing with it? Who's going to pay for the bandwidth? And then finally they were like, ugh, DJ asks the questions again, and we don't have any answers. And then suddenly we had this report that came out 
from a blue commission uh, uh, panel that the president had established, and half of their recommendation, nearly half the recommendations, were all about using technology and data. And suddenly, the team was like, hey, you know what? DJ's team is coming up with all these things. That's really getting, that's, get, that's got some legs. And then over time, for more than a year and a half, is what took us to get momentum. And, and so momentum is, by definition, mass times velocity. Mass is people or dollars. Mm -hmm. Velocity is a vector. We're not scalers here. And so it's the direction the policy is pointed in. Can you change it? And how far is it, that scalar of that vector? And if you kind of look at those kind of components, that tells you where and how to get momentum and then build on that momentum. And from the inside, that's, and then you have to story tell. And once you story tell, then it becomes part of the rubric because people start saying, how come we can't have that? We want more of that. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, I am Andres Medina, a PhD student of mathematics at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, earlier in your talk, you mentioned talk, uh, talking over the phone with medical staff, uh, crying and, and amidst the pandemic crisis. I want, my question is, how can we as a community get a better sense of the impact that our models and decisions have on real people and the real life of human beings? Yeah, oh, thank you for asking this. So one of the things I t really try to encourage is, and, and this, I'm not saying I came up with this. This happened, President Obama taught me this. He said, you have to n get people at the table if you're developing these policies. He's like, they just can't be groups. And so we would go out and we talk to people and we try to bring back their assessment. And he would say, who's at the table? And we'd say, like, you know, this research group or this group that represents this type of disease, Cancer Survivor Network, this type of thing. He said, no, where are the people? And what it really taught me is that we have to get the names and understand the stories of the data points. We have to really engage with them. We have to talk with them. We have to be able to tell their stories on behalf of them. And when you get out in the community and you start doing it, and I, I'm not saying it's easy. It's really awkward and weird. It's not something that nat comes naturally because I'm like, who do I call? You just start calling around, honestly. Uh, one of the ones that was really important for me is I started just asking police chiefs with the help of uh, Lynn Overman to say, like, can we visit you? Could you just give us a tour of the jail? Could you tell us what's going on? And people are like, you actually want to visit? Really? That's weird. And by the way, this doesn't, you don't have to be the US chief data scientist to do this. A lot of times I would do this and then people would, I wouldn't tell them who I was or my role. And then and eventually they'd find out and they'd be like, uh, yeah, we would have done something different for you. I'm like, that's the whole point. <laughs> but like, you know, one of the things was there, it wasn't that I was special in any way. I wasn't empowered to call these people in these hospitals. They said, I'm trying to accomplish this. Can you help me? Do you know somebody at this hospital who you could put me in touch with? And I started building a network that would get me there and then people were like, okay, DJ's actually trying to help. He's trying to do something. And because of that, it, it, it kind of grew and grew and it gave me a, an ability to get in there. But the honestly, the biggest thing was just to try to tell people like, what, wh tell me about what your day is like. Tell me what's going on. And then trying to find something, something I might be able to solve a problem for them with or connect them with somebody who might be able to have a, 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 a solution for. So kind of having that attitude of like, I will solve some problem for you, has been the way I've done it. Uh, but, but the thing that I think I try to do the most is come back with a start. I'll tell you this actually a quick one. So for during the California COVID response, Kara actually had this, like we were really concerned. We didn't actually know what was happening to the people. We didn't know the stories of the people impacted by COVID. So she created this, um, uh, basically a survey tool that was able to be put onto the California Department of Health website when people were trying to find out about COVID. And it just gave them basically a way to just write a little bit about what their life was like and what was going on. And then she would put that into a briefing book that would go up every night to the governor, directly to the governor and the governor's team. And guess what's the most read thing that was there? 
It was all the stories of what people were like. And it was so insightful because somebody would say, they would just say like, this is what's going on. And you'd be like, geez, didn't think about that. Uh, oh, wow, that, yeah, we blew it on this policy. We need to fix that now. And, and that level of insight, when you take you know, all these tools that we have in abstraction of data and metrics, but then connect it with somebody who's on the ground or being able to communicate and tell their stories, it really switches you from a, like aggregation to we have to solve a problem for this, this person tomorrow. What are we doing for this person tomorrow? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. These will be our last two questions because yeah. I want to move the conference along. Connor? Perfect. Yep. Yeah, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, yeah. It was really enlightening, felt really conversational, so I appreciate that. Sure. Um, that's, that's credit to him. Right. <laughs> Steve's uh, um, One of the major themes I got from this, right, is the power of not only learning from data, but just the power of learning in general, the power of education. Um, with the rising cost of education in the U.S., as someone who's worked at the federal level, mm -hmm. what issues do you see that, you know, um, causing, and how do we address this as a nation? Yeah. So we could take this a whole bunch of different ways, and, and I think that, that we need to attack all of them. So one, at the fundamental core, is we have a, um, a pipeline from preschool to prison, effectively. And so we take a large portion of our population and shove them to the side already. Two is we have inequities in how women are paid. And so we still have that. And so 50% of our population is not getting adequately paid. And that creates also this, we see this, 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 this breakdown in STEM. And you know, teenage girls, at, uh, oftentimes middle school, they start before middle school and they're loving math. They get in middle school, they hate math. And so we just lose them at that point. That's unacceptable. And then you kind of move to the collegiate level and well, if actually even a high school level, the cost of private education versus public education, what are we doing for that infrastructure? And then uh, at our collegiate level, what does it mean to cost and afford uh, education and, and how do we fund it? So I don't think there's any silver bullets here, unfortunately, there's no silver bullets. What we do need to have is a national strategy. That strategy cannot start only at the president's level. It actually needs to be a ground-based one. There's something that I think which I wish we would adopt more acutely across the populations, which is what we call scout and scale. We should look across the country of all the different ideas, because each town is an experiment, and say, what is going well in these? What would we like to see? And then ask, what are the policies we need to put in place to actually allow that to, to happen and foster and take, take place overall? That, that is not happening in the level in the way that we are asking w teachers and those what what could work and then probably the biggest one i think we have to do is fundamentally is invest in our educators like we don't it's too expensive here in california particularly in silicon valley too expensive to live as an educator that's we see that not only that we see that for firefighters we see it for essential workers we see it for you know everything so I, I think that would be kind of the kind of the quick version that's that's there. But I think we we it's a thing that it is one of the topics that keeps me up at night of like how do we get our a handle on it because it's not this is not sustainable the way we're going right now. I wish I had better answers. No, it's good. Maybe some of you will. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Delia Zeme. Uh, I'm a data scientist with Anheuser Bush. Um, my question is mostly, you have touched some part of it, but I think I still mm -hmm. want to highlight the areas that I think are still left. It is about representation. Yeah. Uh, in a field like this that exploded quickly, it was mostly intelligent people repositioning themselves, learning and switching and becoming data scientists. Mm -hmm. So if we are complaining that, hey, things like people are not well represented before, that we still see that structure in, in our field currently. I'm wondering, because if you talk, like some of the things you mentioned is like data science will be driving mostly policies. And policies means that even communities that we are not represented, we still have to obey those policies or the rules or whatever changes. Mm -hmm. Which, and we know like talents are distributed everywhere, but opportunities are not. So I'm wondering whether there should be a way that in public sector or public policy to guarantee that whether it is school or companies, because now we have what I consider, at least from my experiences, I consider generic. Like they will say, okay, Google, you must have 5% women. 
but it could be five percent women cleaners. Hmm? They are not actually at the top of weird things, critical things are happening, or like underrepresented groups and so. So we still need to disaggregate, go to the different sectors and see in your department do I actually have mm -hmm. this representation. I don't know currently, because I come from Canada, I don't know whether the US has a policy that guarantees like this kind of situation, both at schools or companies, but uh, like that's my area of concern. Because mm -hmm. even if I look at this room, I still see like, hey, this, this is still going like one side. And if we continue this way, policies that concern me will still be made without like even my consent or my opinion. Thank yeah. You. So I think it, it's well said, uh, and, and I think what we have to ask ourselves is, how do we get there? So the, f the first is, like, right now there is no, with the stepping down of uh, Susan Wojcicki from YouTube, there is no major uh, CEO leader who's a woman. We don't have that. We don't have people primarily of color outside of, uh, of being Indian who are leading any of these major organizations right now. So we have, we have a problem. Like we just should call it like it is, we have a problem. What do we do about it? I think is a couple of things. I think there's a lot of people who've tried different quota models, there's other type programs. But if there's one that I think is going to take place the most that I would just kind of have, because I know we're trying to wrap up and I'm happy to talk about it a bit more afterwards, is what we have to do fundamentally is if there's one thing I could say that we would do more often than not, is I wish we would be more aggressive in mentorship is if you think about how do people get to where they are, it's because someone who's powerful is willing to take a chance on somebody who is new to a role or a chance shot. That how do the people get introduced to those opportunities is all the self-reinforcing social dogmas that are there. And so part of what I say to people is one, this is why I say it's a team sport. You should be looking out for everybody else. The fact that so many people of women, people of color have been on our teams shows that it can be done. Is it acceptable? Should we pat ourselves on the back? Absolutely not. It's, it's just the first step and it's shown that it's not durable. We have to keep investing in it. But the part there that I would emphasize is all of us are in some form of privilege or another. Everybody here has some place where they could get, need help. And so if you ask yourself, how could you help somebody else here in this room? Who else, somebody out there that if you just took a little bit of time, if you took one extra call, what would that look like? Then that's actually how I think we start changing the game of ourselves as a community. Because it starts with us as a community as data scientists. We can't expect others to solve the problems for us or to put policies in there. We should be leading from the front. We should be showing all the other communities how this should be done. And everyone should be saying, why can't we be more like the data science community? Because they figured out. That's the version that I think, I believe that is, is where we start. Necessary, but not sufficient. All the other things need to be figured out from there too, because we have systematic issues across the board on these things. Thank you. Thank you.